Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fall Preview Day. This is the presentation for the Western Fanshawe Collaborative BSCN Nursing Program. My name is Jessica Timbrell. I'm the associate co-associate director of um, undergraduate nursing programs for the Arthur Labatt Family School of Nursing. That's at the Western site. Thanks for joining us today. You may be wondering about that collaborative part of the Western Fanshawe Collaborative Program and what does that mean? Quite simply, it's a BSCN in nursing that's jointly offered between Fanshawe College and the University of Western Ontario. And this is kind of how it's laid out here. So we have the, the structure here, 125 students starting at the Western site and 125 students starting at the Fanshawe site. Um, and students uh, are at either site for the first two years. Fanshawe, they're only offering the first two years and then all students come over in the third year and graduate together. So that's kind of the structure of how the program is laid out on the collaborative part of it. And everyone graduates at the end with a degree from Western University. We'll go year by year. Year one of the program is, uh, you can go by that title of that very first course list listed there under term one, foundational concepts of nursing. The whole purpose of the first year is to lay the foundation for everything that comes after. So you'll notice that term one and term two are very similar. Um, these are half courses offered in each term with the exception of uh, human physiology, but they look very similar and the courses um, are very much uh, foundational in terms of foundational concepts and some foundational skills, basic skills like communication and caring and so on. In term one, students take an anatomy class and in term two, they take a writing class. This is to prepare students for the type of scholarly writing that's required by the nursing program. Um, so, so that course is right up front in the first year of the program and a full year course in year one is physiology. That course is online. In year two, the complexity begins to build a little and students start, um, students are sort of divided in half. Half of the cohort starts with a health promotion and caring families and communities course, which is about nursing families and, and nursing in the community setting. And the other half begin with health promotion and caring supporting health, which is a professional practice um, course as well with, with lab and simulation involved. So uh, the, that's the reason the students are divided in half, half start in one, half start in the other. And then when the second term starts, they flip uh, and take the opposite course. We'll be more, I'll be uh, talking a little bit more about lab and simulation in just a little bit, um, but that's how on-site professional practice looks in, in second year. Um, introduction to health informatics. Uh, in second year in, in term one. This is looking at um, big data, at health information, how it's managed, how it's stored, what we do with it. Pathology for nursing, which is also an online course. And students have the opportunity to take a half credit elective here uh, in year two, uh, one in term one and one in term two. And students are really encouraged to be uh, as creative as they like with, with what they'd like to take as their elective. Many students stick with the health field and take something like psychology, something in the health related fields and other students choose to go way outside of their um, kind of nursing education and choose something entirely different, maybe a language, something different. And they're encouraged to do that, um, to really think outside the box there with those electives. In term two, there's a research course, so looking at appraising research, understanding research, qualitative and quantitative research. Um, a pharmacology course, so learning about, nurses give a lot of medications, and so learning about medications and how they affect the body, uh, and that uh, course is 
again, another online course. And then there's that other half credit elective there in year two. Year three, the complexity um, starts to ramp up quite a little bit here because students have that first and second year of, of nursing knowledge at this point and, and can really um, uh, explore kind of more complex concepts in third year. And so in term one, students take data analysis. This is a, essentially a statistics course. So understanding that aspect of research, appraising research and, and doing research. Health promotion and caring clients with health challenges is uh, a course that is sort of acute care in nature. And um, this course uh, is a acute care placement as well. So kind of a hospital course, if you will. Um, and there's 144 hours of clinical practice time here in this course. Um, students are placed um, all over. Um, in our LIN, which I'll, I'll talk about in another minute as well. So the, the placements vary and the placements are arranged in such a way, this, this placement is assigned uh, and they're arranged in such a way that students don't end up in the same placement um, or the same area type of placement more than once. We're really, um, we really find it's important for students to keep an open mind and be placed in lots of different areas so they really get a sense of the kinds of work that nurses do in these different environments. Microbiology and immunology for nursing is a course that's offered in, um, in year three and, and more complex concepts now getting right down to um, processes at the cellular level and understanding um, uh, immunology from, from the nurse's perspective. There's a 0.5 elective credit here in term one as well. And in term two, we start to branch out a little from our own context, our own Canadian context, and start looking outside and around the world at the more global context and, um, and how the global context does need to be considered from the, the smaller context in which we live in order to truly understand human health and healing. Health promotion and caring clients with health challenges too is another professional practice placement. And this is a different placement than the one that students were in the first go around, but also acute care. And there's some simulation that goes on uh, in this in this term as well. We'll talk a little bit more about simulation shortly. Two half credit electives here in this term are available to students as well. Before we get to year four, it's worth mentioning our AY4, accelerated year four, um, that students are offered at the end of year three. It's a program that, not a program, within our program, allows students to finish their third year of study, and then move immediately into beginning their fourth year of study, which means they would then graduate in December of their fourth year, as opposed to the spring, April of their fourth year of school. It's not for everyone, but, it's, um, but it is for a lot of students. A lot of students are very interested in this, and we can take 120 students um, in our program and put them through the AY4. Um, and so, so some students are really interested in finishing early. Some students are just really interested in keeping their momentum at the end of third year and, and headed right into fourth year, graduating a little early. There's also an elective opportunity uh, offered in, uh, it's usually in May after the third year. Uh, it's an opportunity for eight students to go to Rwanda and engage in a variety of, of practice activities and um, uh, nursing related activities in Rwanda for four weeks. And these students um, uh, apply to, to go to Rwanda and be one of the students that, that attends that trip and they get a uh, 0.5, so a half credit um, out of that experience. So that usually, as I say, happens in the month of May. And they receive a lot more information on what that experience entails uh, in third year. And so fourth year, 
then looks like this. We have term one that has some courses in it and then term two you'll notice looks a little different. So in term one, students take a professional ethical and legal obligations course, which is exactly what it sounds like, but it's understanding our obligations from an ethical and legal perspective. Not that we're not talking about that perspective earlier in the program, because we are, but the complexity ramps up a little here. And we get into some discussion of policy um, at the policy level of uh, legal and ethical obligations there. Advanced concepts for professional practice here is another placement, another 144-hour hospital acute and complex care placement. Again, something that the students haven't been placed in before, so they're getting a broad um, experience across different settings. Future Directions for Nursing and Healthcare. This is a course that looks at, also looks at uh, policy, this time health policy, uh, and looks at contemporary issues, contemporary trends in nursing, in the nursing profession, collectively as a profession, where are we going? Where do we see ourselves um, as nurses uh, locally and globally? And there's two half credit electives offered there. And in term two, you'll see there's just one thing listed here, and that's because this is the capstone of the nursing program, really, for these students. This is the professional practice integrative practicum experience. So this is a 456-hour preceptored experience, and there's a variety of placements that we uh, use all within our LIN, which I'll show you in a moment. This preceptored experience means that it, it's not a clinical group going into a setting with one instructor like the other uh, experiences are in, in third and, and fourth year. There's a group of eight students placed somewhere with one instructor and that's where they spend their 144 hours. This experience is a little different and this is an experience where students are placed throughout our LIN in a one-on-one in a -on -one preceptored relationship. So this is preceptors that we um, have are preceptors that work in these areas. So essentially they're working alongside the experienced nurse that works in that particular area and they work full-time alongside that person for the duration of their experience there. Um, and the idea of course is for them to begin very much uh, in uh, closely uh, working with their preceptor, you know, learning how the, the unit runs, what the placement um, involves and, and how to, um, uh, what kinds of nursing skills are utilized there, right? All the placements are, are pretty different from one another. And then as the placement progresses, students become more and more independent. Their preceptor is still always there on all of their shifts, supporting them supporting their learning. They're there not as an extra pair of hands, they're there learning, they're doing the nursing work and learning what it is that nurses do in that particular environment. Um, and they become more and more independent so that at the end, uh, students really are ready to practice independently. I'll briefly talk about our compressed time frame program before getting into some of the other details you might be wondering about for the collaborative program. The compressed time frame program is a little different. It's our program here at Western. It's a, just a Western program. It's not collaborative. And it's a 19 month program where students graduate with their BSCN having started in September of the first year and graduating in April of the second year. So compressed time frame is right. It's very compressed. It's, uh, it's only for a certain type of student and there's some, uh, there's some requisites, prerequisites that we have of these students. Uh, first and foremost is these students have to have at least 10 university level credits. And, and truthfully, most of the students in this program have a university degree, one or more university degrees prior to coming to the compressed timeframe program. So uh, it's a, it's a, the reason I mention it here, even though most of you are, are watching this presentation for information on the collaborative four-year program, is because maybe you decide not to start your university education with our collaborative nursing program. Maybe you start doing something else. 
maybe you decide you want to do a year of science or you want to uh, pursue other interests before um, and maybe deciding what you want to do, you're undecided. It's, it's nice for you to know that this option exists. You can come back to the nursing profession if that's what you choose to do after starting elsewhere and not have to invest another four years in a degree. So this option is really attractive to people who are have made up their minds and they're really ready to um, get out there and start working as nurses. And so just this can be tucked away maybe in the back of your mind as an option for later. Here's some photographs of our teaching facilities. We have two labs, one we treat like a skills lab and the other like a simulated hospital, a simulated learning environment. And so some of these photographs are from the lab and some of these photographs are from our simulation environment. And I'll talk a bit more about those environments in a moment. Our lab environment is a nine bed unit. There's a little classroom section where small groups of students sit with one instructor and uh, prepare themselves for the activities of, of the lab. The labs are two hours. In, in the first year of the program, uh, students are in lab for two hours a week. In the second year of the program, they're in the lab for four hours a week, uh, lab and four hours a week of simulation in that health promotion and caring um, course. In our simulation area, we have four pods with four beds in each pod. It's set up like, um, like a hospital, like a ward room, a room with four beds in it. And there's, and there's four different of those pods. And um, we can have different activities happening in them at once. The way we usually use them is for very small group study and simulation. Simulation is very small groups, smaller than lab groups with one instructor. So the attention is um, very concentrated and focused on student learning and, and learning in the moment. So you'll see um, that there's some open, lots of open spaces here. There's beds, uh, real hospital beds all lined up that students learn how to use. Sometimes we use mannequins. Sometimes we use standardized patients. These are trained um, folks who come to us from the clinical skills uh, learning program over in the Schulich School of Medicine. Uh, and they're, they're trained to work as simulated patients. And the best part of those simulated patients is that they provide really good and focused and constructive feedback to students. Regular real patients don't tend to do that. And so this is a real um, benefit to the students learning to have access to these standardized patients and access to these mannequins because we can program them with different findings. We can program them with abnormal findings, which we can't always uh, count on in a, in a live standardized patient. And it's important to uh, learn about, you know, some abnormal findings alongside those normal findings. So that's how we use the mannequins and the standardized patients in these spaces. And there's also a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning that happens here as well. So students working in partners and, and working with each other to really get some good hands-on practice. We have, they're not pictured here except for in a way that I don't think you can tell what it is. It's a, we have WOWS, it stands for uh, works, Workstations on Wheels. These are the kinds of things that nurses bring around with them in hospitals, in acute care facilities. Um, that contain the electronic health record, the electronic medication administration record. They carry medications and supplies in these carts for their assigned patients that particular day. And our students work with something similar so they can get used to working with electronic documents as well as paper documents, because we know that our, our healthcare environments right now are often a hybrid between the two. So our facilities, just a couple more pictures here of our lab and, and simulation facilities. The lab is for isolation generally of skills and practice with particular skills, practice with psychomotor capabilities and skills, um, the, the trajectory kind of of how a skill is 
to be developed in our students begins in the classroom with their theoretical learning and knowledge and understanding of a, of a particular concept. Then we take them to the lab and they sort of put that skill into action and we isolate that skill, we learn how to use that skill. And then when students go to the simulated practice environment, we provide context for when such a skill would be used and they engage with clients in a contextual type uh, setting and scenario. So as I mentioned, we use standardized patients and computerized mannequins. We have low fidelity and high fidelity mannequins that do a whole host of different things. And our simulation program is getting more and more sophisticated all the time. We've recently moved into uh, a new building. I don't know how recent I suppose it is anymore. In 2017, we moved into a, a beautiful new facility here on campus that has a brand new simulation lab in it. And we really had a lot of um, input into how that environment was shaped and, uh, and, and shaped to suit our purposes. So simulation offers students the opportunity to work in a, in a safe and controlled environment prior to going into real environments with live clients and vulnerable populations. Students really um, don't necessarily have an appreciation for how complex acute care environments um, are and that they really do need to know what they're doing before they get there to some extent. So we believe really strongly that our students are learning to practice with clients, their partners, with clients and families, but not on them. So there are certain number of things that students need to be competent in um, and safe in, in order to walk in and perform safe, competent care to live clients. And so that's where simulation comes in for us. We, we design scenarios and opportunities for students that mimic the kinds of common um, scenarios and, and findings that they might see in a real setting. And we provide an equitable experience for all students who may be placed in different areas that don't necessarily allow them to see certain kinds of common you know, situations. So certain kinds of common um, diseases and, and the outcomes of, of assessments in those kinds of um, diseases, certain kinds of psychomotor tasks, um, assessments. These are things that we can standardize and uh, create equitable experiences for, for students in these safe and controlled environments that really do allow them to be competent before uh, they ever enter the real clinical environment. Something else that's great is that these environments are still learning environments, even though they're meant to resemble shifts that a nurse might work in a, in a acute care setting. They're still learning environments and the main objective is still for students to learn. So the groups are very small. There are no bigger than six students in a simulation group with one instructor. And students work independently, they work in pairs, depending on the scenario, um, to provide uh, care for about a two and a half hour period of time. This is in the second year I'm describing, in the second year of the program in their, in their um, acute care simulation course. It's a four hour shift, two and a half hours of which is spent directly caring for the client and the other time is spent briefing and debriefing to really understand what they've gotten out of the experience. Students get feedback in the moment from the instructor. There's a, there's a balance there between allowing students to be free to make choices and decisions and see how they play out with patients and providing enough support that students have the confidence to continue to practice and do those things in this environment. So instructors are, are, are trained in, in that respect to provide students with the kind of support they need, but the kind of freedom they also need to learn perhaps from their mistakes. The immediate feedback that they get from instructors uh, is just as beneficial as the immediate feedback they get from their patients. So any, any simulation that involves a standardized patient always includes feedback from that person at the end of the shift um, that is um, year appropriate, so, so learning level appropriate feedback 
um, for students that they can then take with them and, and reflect on and apply during their next shift. The professional practice placements that the opportunities placements that the students have um, throughout their years in the program are in a wide variety of locations. They can be in hospitals, they can be in community agencies and um, for example, in our community health centers, there can be placements in long-term care, public health, mental health, mental health, home care. This isn't exhaustive, of course, but these are some examples of the kinds of environments that students uh, may find themselves learning about the role of the nurse in those different environments. And as I say, we're careful to sort of spread around um, the experiences so students get a really broad range of experience. This is the Lynn I was telling you about. Our Lynn is the Southwest Lynn. Lynn is the local health integration network and this is our territory if you will. It's the largest, the Southwest Lynn is the largest in Ontario. That's the one that we operate within and these are where our placements are located. There are only a couple of exceptions of when our placements are located outside of our Lynn in, in certain circumstances um, but for, for the most part all of our placements happen within the Lynn and the territory outside of the Lynn is territory that belongs to other schools of nursing and placing their students. So um, in years three and four, the placements are, are typically within our Lynn again, typically in, in London, Stratford, Tilsonburg, Strathroy, um, in St. Thomas, in Woodstock, and as, uh, as far as Owen Sound. And the integrative practicum uh, can be anywhere in the Lynn. As I say, it's a very large, um, it covers a really large area, which is great. We have access to some really, really great placements in here because of that. Once students are through their program, they finished their 456 hours of their integrated uh, practicum, they're eligible to write, it's not really write anymore, it's sit for their licensing exam. So students graduate with a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing from Western and they write an NCLEX. The NCLEX is um, like a registration exam, like a computer adaptive uh, exam. It's pass fail. Our students at Western have extremely high pass rates on the NCLEX, NCLEX exam. And once they've passed that exam, they're able to apply for licensure with the, our governing body, which is our licensing body, our, our CNO, our College of Nurses of Ontario. And that's for this province. Other provinces have their own colleges. Some of the careers in nursing, just like our placements, they're varied and this is not an exhaustive list, but um, these are just some examples of places that nurses work and the reason we are really careful to spread around those, those placement opportunities with students, make sure they're not in the same place more than once and they get as broad of an experience as possible is because many students, uh, myself included, when I was a student, come to the program with ideas already of, of where they want to work, um, as well as areas that they believe they don't want to work. Um, and right, and that's, and that's natural, a lot of students have those ideas when they when they come to the program. Some students don't and they really are open to wherever we place them. It's important to have a really open mind because so often, again myself included, um, I thought I knew what I wanted to do and once I got there I thought this isn't actually what I thought this was and I liked this other thing better surprisingly. Um, right that happens to our students all the time and they they find that they're really opened up to something that they never considered before because they got placed there once. So keep that in mind as a prospective student, keep that in mind, keep a really open mind about what you think you'd like to do and what you think you don't want to do because that may all change once you get here and really start um, thinking about nursing differently and working in some of these different environments that nurses work in. You might be wondering about some of this stuff. I should have mentioned at the beginning of this 
presentation, and I'll remind you at the end as well, please feel free at any time to put your questions in the chat function. Our academic staff is waiting there to respond to you. And if you have any kinds of questions at all, please feel free to do that and we'll get to you as soon as we can. Program admissions requirements. As of September of 2020, so as of this past September, uh, students need to complete the CASPER test. The CASPER test is something you may have already heard of. Some other schools are doing it as well. It's a computer-based assessment for sampling personal characteristics. That's what it stands for. So the CASPER is looking at non-cognitive skills, interpersonal skills, um, qualities like empathy and compassion, judgment and insight. It's, it's looking at the kinds of things that are, that are non-cognitive and can't be easily um, you know, measured through your grades. And as a result, it's also something that you can't study for. So the CASPER is something that you would uh, book. Uh, if you are looking to apply to our program, you would, you would book a CASPER test um, and that would be your first step there. So as far as grades go, six credits, minimum of 65% in each, which of course doesn't mean that as long as you have 65%, you'll gain entry to the program. The, the entrance averages are much higher than that. But what you do need is you need a grade 12U English, Biology, and Chemistry, and then your next three best. That's how your average will be um, calculated. You need a grade 11 math, you need a minimum of 65 in grade 11 math, but that's it. Having a higher grade in grade 11 math doesn't give you any advantage of any kind. You can certainly use a, a grade 12 math um, if you'd like to, but that's, that's what the minimum requirement is there, is just that 65% uh, in that grade 11 math in functions. Oops. I went backwards instead of forwards, okay. So how to apply. So your guidance counselor has your application access code information, so you get that from, I'm sure you're already thinking about these things because you're looking at this presentation right now. So this is the information you get from your guidance counselor and then you visit OUAC. Um, this is the website that processes all of your applications. Um, for Ontario universities. And so you log in with your information uh, and complete your application there. It's a $150 fee for three program choices. So you've already paid for them, you wanna pick three. And so that you know, Western and Fanshawe count as two separate applications, even though we're, it's, a, it's a jointly offered program, the two different sites are two different, so they count as two of your three applications. You don't have to apply to both, but if you'd really, really like to come to our program, the recommendation is that you apply to both. And then it's $50 for each additional program choice. You can apply to as many programs as you'd like. It's, it's uh, just $50 per um, additional program choice after those initial three. Uh, then you're gonna schedule your CASPER test. That's at takecasper.com. And there's multiple um, testing uh, opportunities, dates throughout the year for that. And our application deadline is February 15th of 2021. And there's no difference with, you know, Fanshawe versus Western. Every, all the applications are through Western. So that's the, um, that's the deadline that you're looking for there, February 15th. There's lots of different ways to get, um, access to some to some funding. So uh, Western has admission scholarships. There's some admission averages uh, required there in the, in the at 90 to 91% range. And you can see the dollar value on those there and, and that they're continuing um, scholarships over the four years of the program. There's Western scholarships of distinction. There's an unlimited number of those. And that's, you can see the qualifications there. Western Scholarship of Excellence. There's um, uh, lots of these. You can read down through the dollar amounts and how they're uh, spread across the four years. There's also admission bursaries and these ones aren't um, dependent on uh, academic, or they're not based on um, academics, they're based on financial need. And so there's applications for those on the registrar's website too, but it's, it's really worth looking into these 
these scholarships and bursaries. Really take a look at them and see uh, what you might qualify for. Look into those. The Western National Scholarship Program um, is by special application um, and it is uh, due by February 14th. There's some, some qualifications there that you can see, some, some prerequisites, and these are for large dollar values. These are, um, these are big scholarships, um, but you need to look into these things to, to see if you, if you qualify. It's important, this is a lot of, a lot of money that could be available to you. And that's our program. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, if you have any questions at all, please navigate over to the chat function and feel free to put your, your questions in there. I'm, I'm sure um, that you have some. I'm hoping that some of the ones that you did have were answered uh, through this presentation. We really appreciate and thank you for um, your interest in our nursing programs and for, for joining us today. And um, uh, thanks again for, for joining us and, and please enter any of your questions in the chat function. Um, we'll be on for a little while longer. <laughs>